Hey, my name is Barbie Armenta. I'm a wife, mother, life coach, and founder of Brave One. Everyone has a story, and I believe that you can be inspired in your own life by hearing another woman's courageous story. We are here to talk about purpose, identity, divorce, blending families. If you're talking about it, I want to talk about it. We are here to have brave conversations. Welcome back to the podcast. I am so excited about today's guest, and you are going to love her. It's Stacy Danford. She is a one-of-a-kind mix of joy and science, neuroscience with a master's degree in mind-brain education. She's a TEDx speaker and has been a gratitude consultant for the NBC show Good Morning Texas. She is the owner-operator of The Grateful Brain, and she is the host of the amazing podcast, A Mental Makeover. Stacy, I am so excited that you're here. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> Yay! Well, first, I wanted everyone to kind of get a little glimpse into you personally and your life. So tell us a little bit about where'd you grow up? Where did that accent come from? <laughs> All the things. <laughs> well, I am a definite podunk country girl. I graduated from high school and from Jim Ned High School which is about eight towns put together to make one school because they're all that small. There were 27 people in my graduating class. So even though I was valedictorian, it doesn't mean a lot when you only had to you know, beat 26 people. Um, but I lived on a farm out in the country with the cows and the chickens and the whole bit and didn't realize what a wonderful impact that would later be on my life. But even though I sound like a hillbilly, I am proud to be a Texas country girl. That is amazing. I'm also a proud Texan, so <laughs> I love it. and love it that you're here. So, um, so tell me what's today. Are you married? What's going yes, on Yes, I am on my fifth husband, if that sounds terrible, but it really... I was married three times by the time I was 21. So the last three, I really count. Um, but I live in Azle, Texas. I have three amazing, incredible children. I have a son who's about to be 33, a daughter who's 29. And then my youngest son is 14. That was God's funny little joke <laughs> on my 41st birthday. I got to start all over again. But I truly think he's the greatest gift of my lifetime. He's my do-over child, and he's the best parts of all of us put together in one little human. I love that. And he's your musician. He is. He is my little rock star. All three of my kids, which I talked about on my podcast this week, are so very different. And I didn't know that as a young mother. You know, you have like one idea of what kids are supposed to be like. And I can say accidentally, I let them all be very different in who they are. But my young, my oldest son is the athlete and the superstar. My daughter is a little smart mouth and has been all her life, is funny and precious, and she was a cheerleader. And then my little son could care less about any sport whatsoever, never has liked it. And I remember one time I asked him, I was like, Brady, do you want to play football? And he looked at me and he said, Mom, with this brain? <laughs> And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess no. Anyway, so when he was in sixth grade, he didn't want to be in choir, so he joined band. And that was literally the only reason. And found out he is incredibly gifted musician. All of his teachers have told me, like, wow, this kid is unlike any other. And I know nothing about music. I'm about as musical as a rock. So I thought he was good, but I didn't really know. But he's my little budding musician and has really taught me the true meaning of what it means when God has given us all gifts, because I know that was not anything I did. It wasn't inherited from anybody in our family. It was truly a gift from God. And I'm proud that I'm at a stage in my life where I, I don't think he needs to be an athlete. And I just have let him bloom in, bloom in his music. I love that. Well, what I'm also hearing from you is I know from knowing you, you are both creative and intelligent that you have those right and left brain balance that is I feel like it's rare and so when you say that you didn't he didn't get that from you I feel like maybe a little of that we well, get you. the creativity I will say from me for sure <laughs> musician ability no so tell me about your past I know that you're an artist I've seen some of your work it's amazing so how did you get started with that how did you learn that you had creativity that was an accident as well I was a teacher for 25 years and I've taught almost every grade there is, except for fourth and kindergarten. And when I was teaching elementary school, I was teaching first grade at the time. And I loved to do 
you know, the art projects with the kids and found out that other teachers weren't doing that. And I just thought everybody knew how, but it was something that came so easy for me and I loved it. Well, then when I moved to fifth grade, gifted and talented, uh, we had huge projects and we got even more artistic and more creative. And later when I moved to Fort Worth and I was like, I don't really want to teach elementary school again. Well, I saw a high school art teacher opening and I literally never even took an art class in college, but I was always good at it. So I went and took my certification to get certified in art and made like a 95 and I never even studied, but it was just something that came natural to me. And so I got a job as an art teacher and did that for the last 10 years of my career and loved it, loved every second of it. And it truly was something that was a gift in me that I didn't know and did not get it from either one of my parents. So I really honestly believe we are given gifts. And when we tap into them, you know, maybe sometimes you don't know what they are, but when you find them and you tap in, it feels like God is blooming inside you and you are growing. And even though now people think science and art are at oppositions, but I truly think they're very similar because science is creative. It's creating a hypothesis. It's creating answers and experiments to find the answer. And I, I believe that being an artist makes me a better scientist because I, I look at things from multiple perspectives instead of like my husband, who's an engineer. Sorry, honey, but he gets kind of a one track mind and he just keeps going with it. And the creativity in me loves to look for multiple options. So it was an accident, but here I am. I love that. I love when we think about our identity and like being authentically ourselves, when we look through our past, we can see that our past leaves clues. And so I love that you saw that and just nurtured it along the way. And it didn't get lost. It did not. I, I feel like God, sometimes the angels and God are like Hansel and Gretel and they're, you know, leaving little breadcrumbs for you to follow. And sometimes, you know, a rabbit or a bird grabs one and you miss a trail. But, uh, you know, eventually if you keep following the, the crumbs, you will get back on your path. And I, science is become my insane passion and I'm obsessed with it and understanding about the brain and how you get to where you got. And, you know, it kind of bloomed in me many, many, many years ago when we, my brother and I, we were kids and I knew we thought differently and we were in the same house in the same town with the same parents, but we thought differently. And I always thought something was wrong with me. I always swear I was born in the wrong time zone. <laughs> I was like, this is not my time. And cause I didn't think like other people. And then later on, you know, my brother, he died of a drug overdose. And, you know, we had all, my dad was an alcoholic for years and years. He wasn't violent. He wasn't abusive. We didn't even really know it. We just knew he was kind of, you know, absent at times. My mom cried sometimes. And, you know, we, nobody talked about it, especially back in the seventies, but I knew I was kind of stronger and I knew that, and he used to tell me the demons won't leave him alone at night. And, you know, he said they would come in his dreams. And I kept thinking, well, they come to mind too, but you, you have to be tougher. But when he passed away, I remember being so sad that I didn't understand how to help him be tougher mm -hmm. and how to help him fight with whatever was in my head that made me a fighter differently than him. And, you know, it, it was the reason that I began digging into self-help and science and because we did, we had a lot of the same problems and the same issues. And I was stubborn and I think it served me well. <laughs> it's also gotten me in a lot of trouble, um, but it made me realize like, no, I'm not going to do that. And you can't make me and I will, I'm not going to be that way where my brother was much softer, much kinder really was a much more gentle soul than me. I've been a rebel since birth. And I knew that it wasn't how we were raised. And that's what started the, the nature nurture science discovery in my head that it's 50-50. It's never been proven to be one or the other, more so. But now there's a third part of what we look at when we say nature and nurture, and it's discipline. And Dr. Jerome Luby, who's one of my favorite neuroscientists, is the one who... I understood added in that component 
And discipline is what can change either of those, nature or nurture. And you can learn to discipline yourself and your brain to take you in a new direction. So regardless, if you're like me and you have come from a long line of addiction, many, many people in my family, my granddad, my dad, my uncle, my brother, and it doesn't have to be your destiny. You know, you can follow the crumbs another way, but you can also discipline yourself in another way. If you can't find the crumbs, you can go get them. You can go search for them because science has so many helpful tips that people don't think have anything to do with their life, but they are so united. Science is not just for the nerds and it's not just for people that are going to the moon or you know creating robots, it's for everybody. Science is truly a gift to us all. And I tell everybody that I think God was the first neuroscientist. And when I went back and read the Bible after I graduated from grad school, I was like, oh my gosh, it's been in there all along and I missed it. I missed it. I was looking at it just through the eyes of church, like I'd been taught, you know, good old Southern Baptist kid. And I never looked at it through the eyes of science, but it is in there. It's all in there. And it really has made me a better scientist. And science has made me a better person. It makes me understand the Bible differently than I think other people. There's so much good in everything you just said. Oh my gosh, I love it. I love that you correlate the Bible and science. But when you mentioned nature, nurture, and discipline, I'm like, discipline? That's it? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, that's that's a struggle. You know, when I think discipline, I think, oh, get up at 530 and go to the gym. So please tell me that there is a way that we use our minds, use scripture, whatever I need yes. to be more disciplined in my life. And it's really, that's what people think discipline is. And I did too. And especially a kid who's kind of rebellious and kind of, I've lived on the fringe all my life. And I was like, don't tell me to do something. Like <laughs> The minute you tell me to do something, I want to do exactly the opposite. But it's not that kind of discipline. It's really repetition. And that is how you discipline your mind. And I, I think neuroplasticity is the greatest discovery of neuroscience in the last probably century. But it simply means that your brain is like plastic. That's why it's called neuroplasticity. And it can change and alter based on your repeated practices, so actions or thoughts. And that's what I think discipline is, repetition. If you want a different life, you gotta do it a different way. And you can't do it one time, you can't do it five times, you can't even do it 10 times. When you get up into the hundreds, that's when your brain starts changing. And it's not easy. And I tell all of my clients, you know, don't pick me if you want an easy, quick fix, because you can't change your brain fast. It, it won't work that way. And, you know, we all want a pill. We all want a thing like, let's do it tomorrow. We want to win the lottery. Well, you know, we want things fast and that's not the way our brain works. And, but it can change and I am living proof it can change. My little daddy who is, you know, 76 years old now and stopped drinking when he was 65 and had many, many, many patterns of alcoholism and has used neuroscience to change his brain. And it will work, but you have to do it and you have to repeat it, which is what I call discipline. That's so good. There's a scripture, it's in First Chronicles, I think it's 28, 20, and it says, be strong and courageous and do the work. Yes. And we don't want to do the work. No, we don't. And really, that's the secret. If you want to be a good cook, you know, you can't try one time and fail. It's not going to work that way. And if you want to have a different exercise program and your brain is so opposed to pain. It doesn't want to do anything painful. And that's just the sad truth. Your brain will move toward pleasure always. So think about all the things we want, whether it's finances, it's health, it's fitness, it's a good marriage, it's raising your children. All of those are hard. And so what does your brain do? Move away from hard things and toward pleasure, which is why sex, gambling, drugs, alcohol, food, all of those things are easy. There's no program out there that says, learn to be an addict in three easy steps. It's already easy. That's how your brain is wired. And people feel like something's wrong with them if they have trouble, if they have addictions, if they have gone down a wrong path, if they've struggled and they take it personal. They think something's wrong with them. You're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. You are still wonderfully, beautifully made. Your brain is just working the way it was supposed to, and it follows repeated patterns. And the pattern is to avoid pain and go to food, 
avoid pain, go to gambling, avoid pain, go to porn. And when you teach it, no, that's not working for me anymore. I'm not going to do that. Yes, it's going to be difficult. Yes, it's going to be terrible. Yes, it's going to not be fun, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's when your life begins to change. Well, I know in scripture, it talks about renewing our mind. So, and taking thoughts captive. Yes. So how do we do that practically? That is my very favorite scripture of all. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renew means to do again and again and over and over and refresh every day. You know, the Bible says also that we wake up fresh and new every morning. And I start my morning with a practice of gratitude and I renew what was taken away yesterday. And I, gratitude is what my research study was about. That's what my grad school uh, capstone program was about is what gratitude does to your brain. And gratitude is for sure backed by the Bible. It talks about Thanksgiving and gratitude almost 200 times in the Bible. And science will back every single bit of what's in the Bible up. And when you start your day and renew your mind with something that you are grateful for, it changes not only the wiring, but it changes the chemicals in your brain. And those chemicals can last for up to six hours and if you repeat the process over and over, you repeat the chemicals and gratitude is, you know, people think, oh, you're just so happy all the time. And it's not that you get Pollyanna syndrome. I'm not changing anybody's life situations. I still have crummy situations all the time. I mean, gratitude is not a magic fairy wand to change your life but it changes the way you look at your life. It changes the way that you see the crummy situation because I renew it constantly. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. My heart be thinketh in a whole <laughs> lot of gratitude. And when I feel crummy, I catch myself instantly and go, wow, Stacy, you're going down a wrong pattern. And one little great tip for everybody to do is if they'll just say their own name in the word stop, it will actually stop the pattern and stop that processing in your brain. And so when I feel myself, I hold my thought captive. I'm like, ooh, I'm not letting that run rampant in my mind. It's like a little mouse, you know, running free. And I'll say, Stacy, stop. And instantly I, I even feel my own self like, oh, what are we stopping? Oh, I'm stopping that thought that does not serve me well. I will replace it with something I am grateful for. And gratitude doesn't mean I'm grateful for everything. That is, a, that is a big misnomer and that's a mistake if you're doing that. Gratitude means I will shift my focus and find something I am grateful for. So I just wrecked my car a while back and a deer ran out of nowhere and sideswiped me, totaled my car. And I, you know, caught myself getting mad. I'm like, oh my gosh, like three seconds later and that stupid deer would have been somewhere else. And I was like, wow, I had a car. I, I, st I We came out clean, not a scratch, not a bump. I, you know, had full coverage. Oh my gosh, there are still so many things to be grateful for. And it is a matter of switching your focus. Where are you looking? What are you seeing? Because it changes everything. It's so good. I remember hearing years ago about taking thoughts captive, but that we also needed to replace them yes. instead of leaving that room for more negative thoughts to come. And so I love that you described that so practically, but stop Barbie. I'm going to be saying that. Yes. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it's, it's such so, a great practice. It's so easy too. And people think it has to be hard. And especially when you say neuroscience, they're like, oh, that's scary. Like that's going to be a lot of hard stuff. And I, I do think that's my greatest gift. And I, I treasure the fact that I taught elementary school for so long because it taught me how to make things simple and make things understandable. And I think that is one thing that separates me from all the other neuroscience people out there is sometimes they talk over your head and they don't maybe mean to, um, but my goal is to get neuroscience accessible to the world and make it accessible to everybody because your brain is your superpower, but only if you know how to use it, because otherwise it's using you. God designed it to work without you and it will. It keeps you alive. It keeps you breathing. And we don't tell our heart to beat. It does all these things by yourself, but your brain is not wired to be grateful and joyful and happy. It's just not. And that's the truth. It's wired to protect you. 
So what does it protect you from? Dangerous, scary, hard, terrible things. And by reminding you of it, it keeps you from it, it thinks. So, it, you know, I tell people, if you think of a snake on the, on the sidewalk, in order to avoid the snake, you have to see the snake first and you have to realize what snakes do. That's what negative thoughts and hurtful situations do in your brain. So your brain's not like telling you you're a loser. You're not. You're not broken. It's just saying, oh, you don't like that. You don't like being rejected. So it's like a snake. Avoid the snake. And when you recognize, oh, my brain's just protecting me. Yes, I hate rejection. It feels terrible. Oh, I know what to do instead. Instead of feeling like a loser, I have a list of five things I love about myself, and I'm going to go down that list. I'm fun. I'm exciting. I'm energetic. I'm powerful. I am the most giving person I know. Oh, yeah, they rejected me. That's okay. They're not everybody. I'm still this person. And you have to replace those thoughts because the negative ones will sit and they'll ruminate and they take over your brain. And if you don't make it stop, it's working without you. This episode is sponsored by the Brave Gathering 2022 Revival. Join us at the historic Ridgely Theater coming up October 21st and 22nd. It's two days, live music, real connections, and relatable stories. Get your tickets today at braveone.net forward slash gather. And I cannot wait to see you there. I was just listening to your podcast, The Mental Makeover, and just thinking about you were saying your brain's always listening and the thoughts, you know, when we think about rejection and stuff, we think about other people and the things that they say, but the things that we, I'm much harder on myself than anyone could ever be right. <laughs> on me. The things that I say, maybe not out loud, but it's in there. In there. And people mm -hmm. think if you don't say it out loud, and I think I talked about that on my podcast, like stupid Bambi and Thumper, like <laughs> when they said, you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And so we kind of were thinking in our life that we don't say it out loud. It's not harmful. That is not the truth. Your brain is listening to every thought, even the silent ones that never come out of your mouth. And if we can just learn to catch them before they go crazy and before they run around in your brain, then it makes the biggest difference in your life. Just catch them and go, oh, Stacy, stop. Replace that with something you love about yourself. This morning on my walk, I go walk every morning and this little man just kind of bumped into me and I was saying my prayers and walking and I was kind of just zoned out. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I was just right in his face and he had a cane and I felt so bad. I was like, oh my gosh. And he said, nice to meet you, ma'am. And I was like, oh, it's so nice to meet you too. So I you know, turned my headphones off and I said, wow, do you come here often? He said, every single morning. And I said, that is really incredible and motivating that you're here on a cane walking around. And he said, in 1989, I nearly died and God saved me. And I said, okay, well, you're going to have to tell me more about that story. And he said he was a meth addict. In 1989, he got on a motorcycle high and crashed into a wall going over 100 miles an hour with no helmet on. And he said, I was as good as dead no one gave me a chance to live and they helicopter flew me to Fort Worth and they told my parents I had a 2% chance to live. And he was in a coma for two months. And when he came out of his coma, his dad said, Curtis, your mind is listening. Don't listen to those doctors. You listen to God. And he said he never stopped thinking he was going to get better. And it took him a year to learn how to walk again. And he said, I don't do it fast, but I do it every day. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is the greatest story of all. And I said, I teach people that every day. And I said, I'm not nearly so cool. That's the best story ever. But it's so true because Curtis, your mind is listening. And all of us, your mind is listening to you. What are you saying to yourself? Are you saying, I'm wonderfully, beautifully made. I'm seated at the right hand of God. I am conqueror. I'm powerful. I'm loved. Or are you saying, oh my gosh, I screwed up. I'm a loser. I'm so fat. Nobody's ever going to love me. Your brain is listening and you are going in the direction. Your brain is building wiring to your most dominant thoughts. And by golly, when you change those, your life changes with it. My goodness. That's such a good story. I and love Curtis. <laughs> I also love how God works that he gave you this moment with this stranger to just affirm everything that you're doing 
and in your work and in your life. And so he blessed you, but also what a blessing oh, you know, know. from God to just give you that little yeah, moment. Right in my we path. rush through our life so quickly and the things that are happening and the stories that happen around us every day. And you got that little moment to hear it. I love it. But I want to also, I know that you and I have one thing in common that we probably wish we didn't have in common. And that is we both have several marriages in the past. So I do want you to touch on a little bit on relationships. Like how can you use these things, maybe this lesson of gratitude and would you have done something different if you knew what you know now in the past? Absolutely. But I have to say, I do think my million mistakes are one of my greatest benefits. And I know so many people out there are afraid to admit their past and afraid to just be who you are. And I, I never have been. And I learned that from my dad, you know, who was an alcoholic, ruined a million things, ruined our family, but he is the most precious little human being now. And we're, it's never too late. It is never too late to start over. It's never too late to be your best self. And all you got to do is follow the crumbs back to your path, get back to where you started. It may be plan B, C, D. I think I'm on like plan, you know, Z, um, but I'm still there and I'm still trying. And as long as you're still moving forward, you're still making progress. And I am, you know, now on my fifth husband, some of them were, you know, brokenhearted and my little son's dad left me on my 49th birthday. And I had just declared to a room full of people that this was going to be the best year of my life. And I was so excited to be 49. And I was like, I'm going to do one fun, awesome thing every single month of my 49th birthday so that when I turned 50, I'm going to have 12 things I'm really proud of. Two weeks later, he left me. And I was devastated. I was shocked. I was in the floor crying. And I just happened to get a glimpse of my face in the mirror crying. And I was like, wow, wow. And I literally sat there just devastated seeing myself. And I was like, girl, get up, get up. You have left your value in the hands of someone else. And they just walked out the door. And that is not where your value is supposed to be. It was given to you. God gave it to you and you gave it to somebody else. Get it back and start over again. And that's when I applied to grad school and decided I was going to go back to school and be a neuroscientist at 49 years old. And I was the oldest person in my class. I'd never turned in a paper on Blackboard before. I was like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And I failed my first test. I mean, it was the struggle. It was hard, but that's what life is about. Do you let the struggle grind you into pieces or do you let the struggle polish you up? And by golly, I'm standing here almost 56 years old. I am polished and shiny. I love myself. I love my life. I love who God made me to be. I love the mistakes that brought me here. I've made many, many, many. But when I see someone who's hurting, I know exactly what that feels like. When I see someone else who's devastated and feel betrayed, who feels broken, I know exactly what that feels like. And now I'm able to help them differently than I would have ever been had I just gone through life doing it right the first time. So I own all my mistakes and by golly, I've made a million, but I think they're some of my greatest blessings and I'm polished and shiny and ready to go. Yes, you are. (laughs) You actually shared a story with me about seeing Oprah. Yes. And I want you to share the story, but when I hear that, I see you. Oh, thank you. My daughter and I went to see Oprah in February of 2020. So right before the pandemic, you know, and life was still, you know, of old. And we were so excited. You know, we'd watched her on TV for years and years. And the stadium is packed. The music was blaring. It was fun and exciting. The energy was just off the chain. But when she walked out on that stage, I've never felt anything like it before or since. And, you know, here she was kind of a larger person, didn't care what she looked like, didn't care that her sweater, you know, hugged her muffin. She stood fully in her space and it was palpable. I mean, you could feel it. I've never, ever seen somebody so strongly standing in their space, owning all of it, owning everything about themselves and just being fully who they were 
rolls, jiggles, wrinkles and all. And I was like, Brooke, that's what I want to be. She said, what are you talking about, mom? You want to be Oprah? And I said, no, I want to stand fully in my space. I want to own it all. And I want people to realize I am who I say I am. And you can be exactly who you want to be. You don't have to be somebody else. You don't have to be like anybody. You are wonderfully, beautifully made. Don't ever forget that. There's no comparison. Yes. Right? We look at social media and we see all these people. No filters really needed, yes. you know, with what we say, with how we look, with what we do. And that's what I thought when you told me that story. I'm like, that's you. You do that. I know a few years ago, I really had decided I want to be authentically me all the time, no matter who I'm with, you know, or if, am I online? Am I going to show some pictures online and some not? You know, I want to be the same all the time. And so I think that's such a great lesson. So I'm really excited because everyone's going to get to hear a lot more from you very soon. You have agreed to be part of the Brave Gathering in October, and I cannot wait. So. I cannot wait either. And I'm going to bring all of my best brain tips. And I think that my one of my best gifts is I am authentic and I think that inspires people to realize they didn't have to start out perfect. They don't have to even try to be perfect. And I don't even try that anymore. I feel like perfect is not the goal. I feel like being whole is the goal. Mm, that's good. And being exactly who you are. And I know who I am now. I, I think that when you embrace that, and I'm going to give you all the steps to embrace that and to be authentically who you are and to realize that really the Bible's full of neuroscience and all those great tips are in there. I'll be sharing them with you at the Brave Gathering. I love it. I cannot wait. I know you came to my birthday dinner. We had, I don't know, maybe 10 people at that table. And the next day, everyone I heard from talked about you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and they were just, because they hung on every word because it's so important. You know, I don't think we get this practical, people will say, you know, even in scripture, renew your mind, but how do you do that? And so I love that you're going to give us those practical tips. So cannot wait for me to hear from you at the Brave Gathering. But I have one last question for you okay. that I'm going to be asking all of my guests. Okay. And that is, and you can answer, this could be serious, funny, you decide, but what was the bravest thing that you've ever done? 100% going back to school. And I didn't know anything about science. I mean, my background was education. There were people in there that were, you know, from med school, they were fresh out of undergrad. And I was at the time feeling, you know, I'd just been dumped by my husband. I was feeling dumpy, frumpy, grumpy, lumpy, and stumpy. And, <laughs> and here I was, you know, trying to go back to school. And, but when I failed my first test, I had never failed something I wanted so bad and in a really long time personally. And I, I didn't know what to do with the failure. And I was literally going to drop my class and quit school because it was the day you could still get your money back. And I was walking into my professor's class and to tell him I'm going to drop the class and I needed him to sign my paper. And there was somebody else in there. And so the little assistant said, you know, you'll have to wait. I'll come get you if you want to wait outside. And I had tears running down my face. She knew I was like having a moment. And so I went and sat outside at UTA. And I don't know if anybody has ever been to UTA, but they, their squirrels at UTA have their own website <laughs> and or Instagram. And so I was sitting on the bench and these squirrels were all around me. And this one dumb squirrel <laughs> kept sitting and like doing his teeth at me. And he was flipping his tail back and forth, staring at me. And I was like, He's totally making fun of me. He knows I failed my test. And he just kept on and kept on. And so I kind of like kicked at him, trying to get him to go away. And he kept coming back going. T -t 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 -t. And I got so mad at that squirrel that I got up and left. And I thought, I'll just drop my class tomorrow. I'll just get, I think it was 80%. And I was like, the squirrel literally made me so mad. I got up and left and I went home. Well, by the time tomorrow came, I was a little stronger, a little tougher. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to give this another chance. And then I ended up graduating with 
3.75. But <laughs> it was that squirrel truly who <laughs> saved me. And I also, you know, want everybody to realize that again, life is going to give you struggles. Being grateful, being positive is not going to erase those. It's not going to take those away, but it helps you get a different mindset of, wow, tomorrow could change everything. Everything could change tomorrow. Hang in there and wait on it one more day. I love it. One more day. So good. Thank you so much You're for being, so being here and sharing. And I cannot wait for everyone to hear from you at the Brave Gathering. We'll put all your information in the show notes so they can find you in all the things for your podcasts, um, your coaching, everything that you do. And then also we will put all the information for the Brave Gathering. You do not want to miss seeing Stacy there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I will see you at the Brave Gathering. Thanks for joining me for today's conversation. If this resonated with you, please save this podcast to your playlist and share it with your friends. If there's a conversation that you want to hear, make sure and reach out at braveone.net and send a topic request. Until our next episode, remember to put your brave on.